I've just come back from paddling uh, in the Amazon. Three weeks before I went, I ended up having emergency surgery to have my gallbladder removed. And I just remember sitting on that hospital bed and the, the consultant saying to me, it's really not a good idea that you go to Peru. I was like, you try and stop me. <laughs> so the first time I put paddle in my hands was when I was stood at the top of the river in the Amazon ready to go. There was a switch that flicked in my head that I was so dogged and so determined that I was going to do that 335 kilometers. I, I already had visioned the end and there was nothing stopping me. There was no woman that had paddle boarded that stretch. It was the first time it was completed on a paddle board by a woman. It was just a show that us girls could kind of do it too. So that was, yeah. the, that was the appeal. Be brave, brave enough to suck at something new. All right, hello and welcome back to the Shoe Dares Wins podcast. And my guest today is Kaz Dawson. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Michelle. Welcome. Um, all right, first question that everyone gets, Shoe Dares Wins. Can you tell me how you've dared and won? Do you know what? It's probably just a month or so ago. Okay. <laughs> I like that. Um, so we uh, probably, you already know, but maybe people the other side don't. Um, I've just come back from paddling uh, in the Amazon. And uh, the big dare that I took was um, three weeks before I went, I ended up having emergency surgery to have my gallbladder removed. <laughs> It was the most horrific build-up you could ever imagine. You know, we, we dream about these big adventures and challenges and, you know, this lovely, perfect lead-up of training and fitness, and it's all going hunky-dory. Um, but, yeah, I had um, basically a bilary sepsis, had to have my gallbladder removed three weeks before I was due to fly, and everything oh, was organised and paid for. And, you know, with all the sponsors, we, we've worked so hard to kind of get to that point. Um, and I just remember sitting on that hospital bed and the, the consultant saying to me, it's really not a good idea that you go to Peru. <laughs> I was like, you try and stop me. <laughs> yeah. How many, how many, like what we're taking for prep here in terms of like how long had you been leading up to this adventure? It was sort of 12 months. So, you so know, and I'd already overcome a broken ankle in October. So I thought that was my kind of piece of bad luck, really. So I, I'd, I'd been out to Albania. I'd been whitewater paddle boarding out there. And yeah, stupid accident. Broke my ankle. And I was, that was my sort of determination to kind of get fit and I'd worked really hard overcome that and I'd, I'd done some challenges and races and things were just all like coming together lovely but the bit I hadn't factored in was that uh gallbladder <laughs> and that is so you can draw so I know I've, I've got gallstones really? and have friends that have had to have gallbladders out and I'm, they talk about how painful oh, that operation is it was horrific and puts you out for but didn't you get you got sepsis or? so I had bilary sepsis so one of my gallstones had kind of gone back up and everything had gone really bad and um I think when they sort of sit you down and say you've got to have your gallbladder out like now like we, we need to operate so I was like oh this is actually quite serious <laughs> <laughs> you're like can I just wait till I get down the Amazon and then you can reach that out <laughs> yeah so um I, I basically couldn't make a decision and I think I, I remember being at that point and you know this is really recent this is like you know that sort of month six weeks no, no six weeks or so ago but it was um it was just that moment where I was like I'm not giving up because I knew that if I just gave up um that sort of hope of of, of getting there and, and doing the, the adventure and the trip down the river, that I think that would be me kind of just giving up. So yeah. I was so determined that that was what came, what made me sort of keep really positive. So um, it was three days before I managed to get a sign off from the consultant. Um, within six days of the operation, I was in the gym working all the bits that didn't hurt. And I was just, I hadn't, I didn't paddle at all. So the first time I put paddle in my hands was when I was stood at the top of the river in the Amazon ready to go. Um, but yeah, and talk about daring. I That's think that was, daring. that was me taking a dare thinking, will it work? <laughs> and if it doesn't, then well. <laughs> How much of that do you think like overcoming an illness that you couldn't foresee coming yeah. to getting out there and standing up and starting that first paddle mm. of the journey. How much of that do you equate to like the mental, just focusing on that this is it, I'm doing it, whether or not? I think it, it was mental. I think there was a switch that flicked in my head that I was so dogged and so determined that I was gonna do that 335 kilometers. I, I already had visioned the end and there was nothing stopping me. And I think the, the, the two guys that I paddled with at times said to me, Kaz, we don't know where you got your strength from. And at times we were struggling to keep up with you. And I, I was almost like so focused that I was not going to fail that I think that was... I, I think it was kind of a, a good thing to have happened, maybe. Mm -hmm. But it, it really gave me some drive and determination to get to the end of that 
that river, yeah. <laughs> Why the Amazon? Why that challenge? And how did you get to that? Um, I suppose, like us all, we, we, we like challenges, don't we? And I think, you know, how the world's gone at the moment, everybody's always looking for, you know, the, the next new thing or something a bit bigger, a bit, bit different. Um, and I think with the Amazon, you know, it was... Uh, we'd actually applied originally to go to Alaska to paddle the Yukon. Um, and um, this year they decided not to take any of the paddle boards. So I was like, okay, we can't go to Alaska. Where else we can go? Oh, let's go to the Amazon. Um, so it was kind of like a bit of a whim. And then that all happened very quickly. And before we knew it, we'd sort of signed up, paid a deposit. So I was like, okay, we are going to the Amazon. Um, but I think the appeal was kind of... I wouldn't say that the challenge of the actual river and the paddling, because I found that okay in terms of the distance. I think the the real unique thing about the Amazon, what the appeal was, was the um, environment. Right. I'd never spent time in a jungle before, so I'd never been any kind of tropical rainforests or 35 degrees heat or things that wanted to bite you or sting you or try and, you know, just stop everything you wanted to do, because it, it was a really hard environment to paddle in um i think the easy bit was being on the river it was all the stuff around that that was really hard so that was the appeal i think was trying to find something a little bit different um challenging in some new environments um and also there was no woman that had paddle boarded that stretch it was the first time it was completed on a paddle board by a woman there was um, a couple of guys that did it on a paddleboard last year as part of the challenge and it was the first time they'd sort of introduced sups into that that race or the challenge so it was um quite appealing to think well actually as a woman let's let's give it a go so it was just a show that us girls could kind of do it too so that was yeah. the that was the appeal yeah and, and people will see that you've done it and now hopefully that will probe you know oh definitely to yeah get inspired and do that yeah. so is the race predominantly um stand-up paddleboarders or is it a race that includes other means of getting down sorry challenge 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 not race yeah (laughs) let's get to the end um uh no it's a mixture of two so there's um yeah open canoes but they what's kind of quite unique about the canoes is they're the sort of traditional sort of amazonian ones so they're sort of 300 kilo plus carved out of you know traditional wood the paddles are just like sort of monster sort of 10 kilo they're, 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 they're huge things um maybe exaggerated 10 kilo they're not but they're 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 a good couple of kilos i'm so used to like my little carbon paddle whereas these things are sort of yeah big planks of wood so um that was that was the sort of canoe team so it was kind of the i suppose the appeal of doing it with you know sort of traditional amazonian kind of modes of transport and then um yeah sort of paddle boards were kind of introduced to it last year and it was just kind of looking at if you can do it in a canoe then yeah you should be able to do it on a paddleboard yeah 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 and so the the physical side of thing things the training is that straightforward or are you training for endurance or how does that work um it's a bit of endurance um so you know for us it's been about getting like the longer paddles in um because my job is paddle boarding anyway I do spend a lot of time on the water but it's kind of the wrong time on the water you know if you're a coach or um you're sort of delivering any kind of instruction you spend a lot of time with you know beginners learners so you're never really pushing your top end you're always there to keep other people safe and to guide and instruct so trying to find those little extra bits that would keep testing you so I approach the challenge differently. I, I've done sort of other longer distance bits in the past, but with this one, I really focused in the gym more. Right. And I focused much more in terms of my like cardio. I spent a lot of time on my road bike. So actually building all the other things, which really sort of underpinned and supported my paddling more. Okay. Um, so I think with it, I think the key is not to just paddle. I think you've got to, you've got to be quite like Have broad. a good overall fitness. Yeah, with your fitness. So that, that sort of helped. Um, and then, yeah, we just pinpointed some challenges. So I had a go at the, the SUP 12, for example, where it was down on the south coast. 12 hours, as many uh, laps as you could do in the sea for 12 hours. And they were like, I think they were about three, four kilometre laps. Oh, wow. um, just continuous for 12 hours. Um, and that was that was Exhausting. pretty 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 <laughs> tough. But uh, it, was, it was good because that was kind of beginning of April and it gave me a bit of a check in terms of how much I could do and the sort of the you know, where we were at sort of fitness wise. Um, 
but yeah, it was it was it was great preparing for it. Um, we went to Scotland. You know, we, there was like little things that were just little events that just sort of helped us really. So yeah. And when you started and you landed in Peru to then setting off, what were you expecting and how different was that to what you experienced? It, it was very different, very different. Um, I think the bit that surprised me more than anything was the size of the river. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I've, I've paddled a few rivers and I'm happy with sort of like the rapids and the white water kind of stuff, but this was like on steroids right <laughs> it was huge um i remember sort of seeing the fir- the river for the first time and like looking at the boils and the eddy lines and the rapids and going oh my god like i'm really gonna have to put my brave pants on here <laughs> and i remember like the first day and i it didn't you know it, things happen so yeah it, it doesn't always go to plan so i'd sort of got on um but with this as well with, with the paddle you have to carry all your own gear so on top of our board you've got about 30 kilos of kit so course, we're yeah. carrying all our camping kit, our food for six days, water supply, clothes, repairs, you name it. We, we've got everything on our board. So you've got to be kind of full sort of sustaining as you go. Um, so where we get on, the river is just tonking. It is absolutely tonking and it's huge. And I'm just looking at it and thinking, yeah, we're, we're just tonking. You get on and... To the first rapid, there's probably, what, two or 300 metres. It's not far. So you're there, still trying to make your adjustments, like thinking, oh, you know, have I weighted my board right? And and also because I haven't paddled much because of being off the water with, with like, my gallbladder stuff. So that was all a bit interesting. So I'm getting on it now thinking, oh, God, around that next corner is the first rapid. And it's a big rapid. It was like a grade three, really big, really bouncy, big wave trains, big boils. And I was like, okay we're just going to have to go for this. And it was like the first rapid, first day, a few hundred metres from the start, and I'm already swimming. <laughs> I was like, I hadn't planned for that. But it was, you know, and it was a full board flip. I had to get, you know, flip my kit back around. Then I'd lost my paddle, so it was like on my belly, like trying to, you know, retrieve all my kit, get going again. Um, but, you know, after that, that was the only swim I had in the in the sort of the 335 kilometres. It was the first rapid, the first day within so the first kilometre. got it over and done with on the first... <laughs> yeah. That's pretty scary, though. Do you know what? I've just realised we're not wearing our headphones. <laughs> I was just looking at this going, there's something that I'm missing here. <laughs> you um, yeah. pop them on, and I'm sure there's absolutely nothing wrong with the recording. But let's just double check. Yeah, I can hear fine. It's fine. Can you hear me? Uh, no, I can't hear you. You can't hear me through no. the headphones. No, I can't. Oh. Do I need to be plugged I think it's just because your headphones are disconnected now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is great, isn't it? You know when you say learn from me, don't learn from me. There'll be like bloopers, like a takeout. Yeah. Are we good? This is a first. Right. Oh, that sounds better. Is that better? You yeah, can yeah. Me now. yeah, so yeah. the mics are connected, so that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay. I'll edit that bit out. So, first experience of being in the water, I'm thinking Amazon piranhas. Yeah, there were piranhas. I'm thinking all sorts of stuff in here. Um, do you train for that or is it just get out the water as quick <laughs> as possible? Um, so, there, yeah, there's a few myths in terms of, I think we've all seen those films, haven't we, where piranhas strip a man to the bone in, you know, <laughs> yeah. in 10 seconds flat. <laughs> it doesn't happen. All oh, right, okay. <laughs> and actually, of all the things um, in, in the Amazon was... Um, I was kind of scared of piranhas was actually kind of quite low on the low on the list. Um, so, yeah, we, we saw them and we only saw them actually because um, some of the local crew. So they were helping us with support boats and, and their main job really was to help us with transporting kind of supplies, but particularly water because we couldn't drink the water in the river. Um, and when they were killing time, when we were there, you know, busting a gut, trying to do all our paddling and get to places, they, they just killed time by fishing. <laughs> right. So they were always catching piranhas. So every time you went past with them, they had them in their hands and they were sort of, uh, yeah, waving these piranhas about. And you're thinking, oh, God, so they are in there. Was that for fun or for them to eat? Uh, to eat. And, ah, okay. yeah, yeah, they, they sort of all, they were very kind of, um, kind of subsistence kind of style living. So they were, they were living off everything that they could catch or grow or um, have around the jungle, basically. So, uh, yeah. They, so were these your guides as um, such? They weren't guides. They were, they were support crew. So right. um, how it kind of worked is we had sort of checkpoints we had to make each day at set distances. We had to meet them at set times. 
Um, so as we were going down the river, you know, there'd be certain areas perhaps that we couldn't go because cocaine production or illegal gold mining, you know, all of that was kind of going on the river. So we saw a lot kind of going on in that region and we, we, we you know, on contact tribes, that kind of thing. So there was areas where we couldn't paddle or the river would get quite braided. So we had to make sure that we went left or right or straight on. So sometimes there were kind of critical points where they would be maybe sat to make sure we didn't go down there to help keep us safe. Um, but yeah, they, they very much let us get on with our own devices. You know, we had our trackers, we had our maps. Um, you know, you leave at this time, you get off the water by this time. Um, and, you know, some of the days we were paddling 70 kilometer plus days. So they were big, That's, big yeah, paddle days, stretch. you know, nine hours on the water. And yeah. are you with other people or can there be stretches where you kind of don't see anyone? Yeah, so we were we were paddling as a as a team. There was three of us. There was myself, um, my partner John, and um, Matt. So we were we were the team. Um, so we worked as a three. But yeah, we because the speed the paddle boards went, we were always tracking faster than the canoes. So we were always kind of up front. So most of the the checkpoints, we were just out front, and um, we didn't see anybody. Um, which was great for us because we were up front. It meant we got to see some super cool wildlife. Um, but yeah, at times we did have to second guess, you know, we we're getting our garments out and double checking with maps and you're thinking, oh, you know, have we taken the right route? Or um, the, the, the funny thing is because it was so remote that um, all of the mapping was from 40 plus years ago. So none of the mapping made sense. And because a river <laughs> changes. Changed, changes so much, yeah. such a big river like that. So um, whatever we saw on the map was not what we were seeing with our eyes <laughs> and vice versa. So you, you were constantly trying to look for little clues, but they just weren't there to be had. So it was, it was just going with gut feeling and thinking, OK, well, most of the flow is going that way. Or, yeah, we think that's right. And you were having to just second guess on, on, on occasion. So, yeah. And when I think stand up paddle boarding, I think nice, pristine lake, very, this is, I'm guessing, quite ropey in times like you sort of talk about falling out. What are they in terms of grades of like rapids? Were you going through different grades or? Yeah, so you were. Yeah, so different grades of rapids. Um, and I suppose it's, if you think of like, we all go back to our geography lessons, don't we? And you yeah. remember like the rivers, how they are up in the mountains. And then as they go close to the sea, they get windier and wider with, with how they behave. So where we started was kind of the foothills of the Andes. So there was lots of white water. So for the first two days, it was just jam-packed of rapids. I would say mostly grade two rapids, okay. um, but they were, they were big, high volume. So the, it wasn't like the rivers we would see over here. Um, it was just lots of water getting funneled through, you know, tight gaps. Um, so, you know, when you did fall off, it was, you know, the consequent, consequence was quite low in a sense because there wasn't things to be hitting into, but the swims were quite big because they were big rapids. So um, it was just getting used to... To, to that really but um but it kind of made it exciting so you know I, I paddle moving water over here I paddle the rapids I'm from North Wales so we've got the River Dee and um you know bits in the Lake District we do and, and places there so um I'm kind of happy in that environment but um yeah it was just the the, the size scale and the volume of it was huge yeah and you're concentrating on the river but equally like you said there's many areas within Amazon where there's um, like say cocaine mm -hmm. farmers and um, tribes that I guess have never seen like anyone other than their own tribe is that a thing or is it another it's a thing, it's a thing it's right a thing. Um, yeah the, the the matchup hero um, so yeah there is a tribe there that are an uncontacted tribe they don't want to be contacted and you know there's an area um, so particularly where we started up up the top section of the Amazon, um, it was quite, um, what's the word, sort of untouched, quite pristine. It was kind of rainforest as, you know, we, we want to see it. It was, it was very good. Um, and then as you started moving down, you then started getting closer to sort of the towns and then you started to see the deforestation and the mining and, and, and that side. But the more pristine sort of section, 
Um, there were, you know, tribes, communities. You know, there were people kind of hanging on to that sort of traditional way of living. Um, so we sort of experienced that. And, and there were some tribes and, and communities that we stayed with and you know, we, for two nights, very, very welcoming and it opened up their arms. We, we got these... Um, tattoos from these sort of fruit juice that we all woke up in the morning with these bright blue hands and <laughs> oh, nice. yeah we, it was it was uh, an interesting uh, interesting thing but um, adjacent to them was this non-contacted tribe so we had to paddle through their territory so there was um, it was around 40k that we paddled where we just simply couldn't stop so we were on a river um, and we just had to stay on our boards, keep paddling. The rule was we kept river right, so they were all all of their land was on the left hand side of the river. Um, so yeah, there was a there was a bit of a like oh a bit of an unknown, and you were always sort of paddling like looking over your shoulder and sort of looking across and thinking yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah there's like bows and arrows, spears um, because they they yeah they kill people like they they have killed people yeah um, they're pretty hostile and you know the uh, yeah it was for us a real a real <laughs> which it is I say this. It's kind of nice that that still yeah. exists, isn't it? Um, but I imagine equally petrifying, like you say, having to go past because you don't know how tribes are going to react if they've never really come into contact with other crazy Westerners. <laughs> Just your paddleboards, yeah. <laughs> but equally, I'm, I'm imagining... I've watched too many documentaries about um, coming across cocaine farms or anyone... Like, they don't hang around either, like, because they don't want to be exposed and it can, I guess, be pretty daunting if you were to come across. I'm taking it you didn't, you didn't come across any... You, knew, you were aware that it was there. Right. So there are some areas where we couldn't paddle. So you know how, like, how the river sort of splits off? It'd be like, right, don't go down that left because there is a cocaine laboratory down there. Mm -hmm. uh, occasionally you could smell it. There was this weird kind of like very sweet silage kind of grass. Oh, right. Like very, like almost like something plant like is fermenting it was that that kind of smell um but yeah similarly to you I've I because I knew where I was going I, I sort of clued up on my documentaries and caught up with some you know things on iPlayer and so I had a bit of an idea of like okay this is what goes on um and the ironic thing was when we when we landed in Peru and when we went to Cusco which many people have done if they wanted to go to um, you know, the Inca Trail yeah. and, um, you know, that side of things. Um, one of the first things they give you is... Yeah, the like, coca leaf. The coca it? leaf, yeah. yeah. So on, we, yeah. we were all having the cocoa leaves to chew on and making the tea. So that side of it is all very normal. And, you know, that that's that's just part and part of what happens there. So it was when they started, like, processing it. And then... Um, and I think the thing people forget is in that area it is so so remote that income streams are like non-existent mm. so where do they make the money well it's cocaine mm. it's logging and it's gold so if they are the three options um you know that that's that's what people do for money so um <laughs> interfere with that <laughs> yeah so that you know there isn't you know they say tourism but you know a few people going through on paddle boards or canoes a couple of times a year isn't going to sustain them is it so um the, you know, the, they are looking at that for um for, for income um so we were we were kind of aware of that and um you know, there's a respect as well to that so you were aware that you know what what else how else do these guys live and if they do want things like mobile phones and all the things that we're kind of accustomed to here in the west you know how that yeah. you know so um so there was an element of you know there's an understanding with with that but uh yeah it was just kind of fascinating to be thinking that you know at one at one point one night we were lying in our tents um well I say lying sweating in our tents it was just the most like horrific night's sleep you could ever get in the jungle we were just like sweating 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 and you could just hear these aircraft all night kind of coming in these little sort of Cessna planes and little illegal um airstrips and them just coming in picking up bags of whatever they need and then taking it back out and that was kind of that's, just that's how what it is. that's how it is over there yeah, yeah. it's so interesting because you've got that and then i guess the opposite side of that is the raw natural beauty that yeah. exists there because so much of it is untouched mm -hmm. yeah um what did you see that was cool um probably my top two had to be um the giant amazonian river otters oh 
Because they're like otters, but... How uh, giant are we talking? Like six foot, huge, like massive otters, like giant otters. A six foot otter? <laughs> they're just huge. <laughs> and we were just paddling along, they just like popped up and like looked at us. I was like, that is, that's cool. That's really cool. That is cool. Yeah. Um, so that, that, was, that was great to see. And then um, a little family of armadillos just like scratching up the riverbank. Oh. Um, and then like tumbling back down because it was too steep because they were all like little babies. So that was that was quite good, um, but yeah, we, we saw so many things in the jungle, like so many creatures. Any unwanted creatures, like snakes, spiders. Yeah, yeah. we saw them, <laughs> and it was funny because everything I describe it is the size of my hand. So there's like cockroaches the size of your hand, spiders the size <laughs> of your hand, butterflies bigger than your hand. Everything was like your hand or bigger. Um, but the yeah, there was one night I went to sleep. We pitched the tent. It was quite late, and in the morning, you know, you did your little trowel walk, didn't you, to go and dig your dig your toilet and there's like a nest of tarantulas next to the tent you know a mummy with little babies you know um and yeah one of the most deadly spiders in the world this little wandering spider which pretty horrific death if you get bitten by that so uh. that's the thing isn't it is that going through your mind is always it's not so much getting bitten but it's you're miles from anywhere you're miles from yeah. any help from any kind you can't take with you vials of anti like venom no. for every every animal possible <laughs> under the sun um i had megan hine on the podcast a couple of weeks ago and um she talks about being bitten by a king cobra and being really remote and then being stranded with some lions in uh, wow. like being surrounded by them in the middle of africa and i was like yeah what what happens when that occurs and what's the headspace like and it's interesting how She's obviously learned to deal with situations like that. Did you kind of mentally prep yourself for anything? Or were you just like, let's just see what happens? Well, I haven't got the best track record. I, I seem to be very accident, <laughs> accident prone. <laughs> yeah. So considering my last trip to Albania, I came back with a, you know, a story of spending time in an Albanian military hospital and a broken ankle. And you right. know, that all went kind of completely peak tongue. So to be fair, I'd actually prepare myself. <laughs> <laughs> to come back with that. That. I was like, meh, yeah, you know, uh, uh, something will happen. So I did, um, I did take probably the one of the most comprehensive first aid kits I've ever carried in my life. And you know how you sort of split up kit between you as a group? Mm -hmm. The guys were like, well, what have you got, Kaz? And I sort of showed them my first aid kit and it literally filled like half my dry bag. It was like, I was like, <laughs> don't worry, guys, if we need operations, teeth removal, you name it, I've got it. Like, we're, we're dealing with it. Um, and we, we only had to... Um, really use it in anger once so I was kind of I was happy with that I was happy with that but um we got we did get chased by a swarm of giant Amazonian wasps down the river oh wow <laughs> they just kind of came out of nowhere and um uh yeah they, they just kind of started swarming around us I was like I don't like this and we sort of paddling faster and thinking oh no well the next thing is we're jumping in but they did they stung Matt on his hand um so I kind of whipped out the antihistamines and, you know, checked him over. But I, I probably trebled the dose of maybe what I should have given him because <laughs> I was a bit worried. I was like, but that Amazonian wasps, like... It's going to be worse than what's at home. Yeah, they're not <laughs> going to be like UK wasps, are they? And then I did, um, I did check in with the, um, the safety team. I just said, like, he has been stung. I don't know, are these, like, killer wasps? Like, I don't know what they are. I tried to describe them. Um, but uh yeah they had they, they had an epi pen on standby and and then he just started getting sleepier and sleepier because i'd just given him so much antihistamine it's <laughs> <laughs> like come on matt we're nearly at the finish it's, it's like this i'm is tired amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm just gonna have a nap right here <laughs> so how many days were you on the river um so the challenge is six days so it's six days 335 kilometers wow so um yeah it's, it's big paddling it's big paddling days um but it was the, the the heat i think that makes it tough right um but yeah we were drinking I know, six seven liters of water a day and not peeing it was like wow that's that intense. was it's a lot of water and a lot of hydration and electrolytes just to yeah, keep keep going. So it was it was the environment, like I said earlier, was was what made it really quite quite tough. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it sounds amazing. And um, um, do you have any kind of challenges now to kind of one up that, or <laughs> or is it stay home for a while and rest? Um, 
Well, I've got some challenges in a sense of I'm, I'm taking other people. So I'm, I'm whizzing off to Sweden next week and I've got a nice. group of... So I've got three trips actually out to Sweden and Norway the next, the next month. Um, but it's taking other women out there. So it's trips where, you know, they're going on holiday and having a great time and I'm looking after them and guiding them and, you know, keeping them safe. So we, we've got those kind of trips coming up. Um, I've got a few little things brewing. Um, yeah, there's, I think, coming back and I think um, how I felt at the end of it and the sort of, this sort of next level strength I kind of found with that trip, I think there's like a little bit of... I think once you get bitten by the bug, it's a bit yeah, dangerous, isn't the next, it? Yeah, the next level. So, yeah. And how did you make um, stand-up paddleboarding, which is a passion, into, you know, the business that you've got now where you take other people? Um, was that like a natural progression or something you delved in the deep end with? Um, I think it was quite natural. I think originally it started out as a, as a hobby. Um, so I got into it. And it was by complete fluke because I'd always been a horse rider my whole life. Okay. I'd, I'd ridden horses and then my horse had a, had an accident and um, I sadly had to put to sleep. Um, so I then ended up with all this spare time because I had no horse to look after. Um, so then uh, some friends invited me to go and do a bit of a social paddle. Uh, I did that. I was like, oh, I quite like this paddle board in Malarkey. And within a few weeks I'd bought a board and I was like, oh, I'll give it a bit of a go. But then... It was like one of those things, as soon as you sort of started doing it, it's like, there are, there's like more possibilities here that we can use this as like a, a mode of transport, as a tool to do other things. Um, so quite quickly, like, you know, I tried to kind of upscale, like go and do some challenges, some races, that kind of stuff. And then it, I did that for a couple of years. And then I had friends and family, people sort of saying, oh, do you want to, can, I, can you take me out? Have you got a spare board? So I thought, oh, I'll just go and do my, you know, do some qualifications and, you know, see how it goes. Because I think the safety side of it with paddling and being on the water and it, it, it's, it's really quite important. So um, that was, you know, that was kind of key to do that. And, um, and then I just thought, well, I'll just set Supplass up. And then four years later, it's just kind of, like, yeah. it's, like rolled into it's just something. sort of rolled into a, a beast really so you know this time of year I'm out probably four five six times a week wow. um you know last night it was one-to-ones tomorrow I've got a, a litter pick and club and then we've got coastal sessions coming up over the weekend so um it's it's quite um broad and varied and I think what makes us a little bit different is we do paddle in all the different environments so I'm qualified you know on the rivers in the sea so um, I'm able to give people different experiences and, and we're very fortunate I think with where we are in North Wales we have all of these amazing paddle locations right on our doorstep so from like a, an hour of where we are we can access everything really that clients clients want or need so um yeah, it all all sort of happened, but it's all it's all grown like organically, and um, yeah, we've it, the places I've managed to see, the people I've met, the communities. Um, yeah, it's it, it's just opened so many doors and opportunities, and um, yeah, it's it's I, I can't ever thank it enough for for what it's given me over the last sort of six years. Really, it's it's just been incredible, and yeah. it's quite. Well, I would be right in saying that it's quite a new thing, really. Mm. Um, it's not something that's been around for years. I, I, I see a huge amount of growth in the industry because more mm. people are getting interested in it. Um, I went to Paul, Bank, Paul Bridge Farm, mm -hmm. um, and they've got a lovely lake with now some jetties where people can get on easy enough with a paddleboard. And it's so many people there were kind of setting up and I was like you didn't really see this a couple of years ago yeah. and I think now it's coming in what what's the what's the hook with it what what gets you hooked um I think for me and how I kind of pitch it with the clients is it's making adventure accessible and it's accessible and affordable but particularly for women and I think that's like been our USP with it really we haven't we didn't I didn't necessarily go out and say yes I am just paddling with women but it's kind of naturally um it's kind of naturally happened and 
I would say 90 plus percent of our customers are females. Right. And it's about this accessible, affordable adventure. And if you can get them hooked and, you know, it starts out where they have a little, like you say, a little experience on a lake where they're splashing and messing about in a bit of a circle and, you know, you get the confidence up there and you're like, why don't you come on the river or let's go and do a little journey on a bigger lake or do you fancy going out and giving the sea a go? And to see people go from, you know, that kind of nervous first time, you know, really wobbling, those bird claw feet, you know, absolutely petrified to then um, going on their first journey or seeing them by their boards or, um, and, 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 you know, with the trips we've got going out this month, what is so lovely are there are people on those trips who first stepped foot on a paddleboard maybe last year or two years ago that have kind of gone from, you know, that, that beginner in a pond to doing their first expedition in Sweden or Norway. And to see that and to help be part of that and like facilitate that has just been kind of a magical thing really. So I think that that was what I wanted to kind of do with paddling is, is kind of expand those boundaries, but making that accessible adventure. And I think you know, that that's what paddleboarding does. It, it's more than just in a pond or a lake <laughs> yeah and I, I'm seeing it with swimming I'm seeing it with so many different things now that it's actually about the community yeah and it's the people you meet the conversations mm. you have like I tried while swimming last week with uh, dips and dales and Zoe said to a couple of women in her group she was like we're going with while swimming if anyone wants to turn up and I was like this is great because the swimming is amazing but also it's just about the tea and the cake and the chat and she's like, yeah, it is. It's about people's different life experiences. Um, I think sport has a way of opening people yeah. up, doesn't it? And connecting on different levels. Mm -hmm. Like, And when the entry, the barrier, there's no barriers to entry in terms of you can hire a kit mm -hmm. or you can, for example, go with someone like yourself. The accessibility allows people that probably really need it mm -hmm. to get into it. Um, I know with cold water swimming, there's a lot of trials going on at the moment with mental health and anxiety. Yeah. And just being near water. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not a confident swimmer at all. And still, water provides calmness. Like, you forget the bird. You know, you listen mm -hmm. to the birds. And and I, the thing that I would imagine with stand-up paddleboarding is that you're on top of the water, which in itself has mm -hmm. a... You feel powerful, don't you? Because you do. you're letting kind of nature take you and you're not having to necessarily be cold unless mm. you fall in. But I'm guessing during winter you can go full dry suit. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I'm excited actually to to give it a go. I know Joe's dared me to do it, so it's on the list. Um, so you're going to Sweden. Um, are the kind of adventures outside of the UK more fun? Um, I think it, it again, it, it's just that different, different type of adventure. And it's a way, I suppose, of linking in cultures of different countries um, with, I suppose, something you're familiar with, which is your paddling. But then, you know, it, it then becomes that sort of that, that tool, that kind of uh, accessory that you're able to do your, your journey with, really. So um, I think it, I think it just gives you a unique perspective as well because when I've like visited cities, so things like I've paddled through Paris or paddled through Copenhagen, places like that, um, you see it from such a different way on the water. Um, so like the fjords or when you're you know picking lakes out or archipelagos in Sweden, it, it all looks so so different when you're at your own pace on the water. You know, just going with the flow, it it, it kind of gives a different perspective on a country. Um, and I think that's the the appeal. And I think people have had that have got the bug bad with 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 sup with paddling. Um, I think have looked for again that that next bit of ad adventure. And I think sort of organised trips, you know, it's kind of that next stage in their sort of paddling journey, really. So um, yeah, and it, and it's lovely to see you know friends go with friends or family members or partners. So. You know, that kind of community vibe, that kind of people that know each other sort of all going, you know, just just happens. And um, it's been great as well to like forge links in different countries. So, you know, working with like Sup Driven, Sup Norway, like going out with those guys and building relationships over the last couple of years with them and 
you know, we've got some exciting things like in the in the pipeline for next year in terms of like different trips and opportunities and and sort of that collaboration so again it's it's kind of creating and fostering you know bigger communities really that are beyond beyond the UK yeah amazing well I think you're doing incredible work and I know your own adventures will inspire many other women to dare and win in the world of SUP. Um, is there anything you would say to someone who likes the look of it but is a little bit frightened? I would just 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 go for it. Um, uh, one of my little mantras or something that I've said before is just be brave, brave enough to suck at something new. Like you've got to be that. like you've got to be. And and I think as we get older, we um, we all get a bit like scared of like risk, don't we? We all mm. get a bit of risk averse, you know. Once we you know get a little bit older in terms of our health or having kids or you know different barriers, different things, you kind of look at it and you think, oh, I'm not taking that risk because if that happens, then you know what what's the the outcome of that? So um, I think if you can find a way or an environment that is you know it's safe, it's friendly. Uh, we, we keep going back to this word accessible, but if we if we can try and find that, I think um, you know it's a really great sport to to introduce people to. And um, there's a lady actually that I'm working with at the moment, and I think I, I want to do like a little story or something about it. But she approached me a few weeks ago and said, "Kaz, I really want to go to Norway. My friend's going to Norway, but I've never paddled before." I was like, "Right, Sal, roll your sleeves up, girl. Let's see what I can <laughs> do with you." So I'm literally whipping her into shape at the moment. We're having we had a, a lesson last night, another one-to-one, and we're having like one-to-ones on a weekly basis. Um, I've been just up in the game each week with her. Um, and yeah, she's just gone and booked a trip. And I was like, we can do this girl. And mm-hmm. she's like 69, you know, and she's just gone, I want to paddle Norway. And she's never been on a paddle board. I was like, right, yeah, we, we can do this. So um, I think trying to find people like that, that can, you know, they inspire me in, in, in thinking that, you know, actually, if I'm 69 and getting on a board and going, yeah, I'm going to Norway, I think that's like a great place to be, isn't it? Yeah. So. Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah, it does. And it makes the rest of us kind of sit up and think, hold on a minute. Yeah, we need to be jumping on the bandwagon here with whatever <laughs> adventure is that you've been thinking about. There is no time like the present. Like, no. And you, you I've, I think since having kids, like, I'm, I blink and it's the next year. Yeah. Um, and I say yeah, it's probably age as well. Four, Forty <laughs> this year, and I just feel like, where's that come from? <laughs> no, I've just I'm forty this year as well. And it's I know it's just like, where did that creep up from? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, amazing. Well, thank you so much for coming and sharing your amazing stories. I'm looking forward to following you and following oh, in your next crazy adventures. Although I think <laughs> it's hard to one up the Amazon. Um, but yeah, thank you for coming and sharing your story. No, my pleasure. Thank you. Thanks okay. for the invite. Yeah. You're welcome. Yeah. Well, I've got, well, before we finish the podcast, I've got a little gift for you. And then <laughs> we do a little special bonus edition if you're up for it. Some yeah, quick yeah, fire questions. Yeah, okay. yeah. So I've got you a little tea. She dares wins mm. tea for you there. Oh, amazing. And some stickers. Oh, well, I, I've brought some soot plus stickers. Oh, amazing. We'll do some sticker swaps. I love swapsies. a sticker swap. <laughs> <laughs> I do love a sticker swap. I'm going to have stickers oh, on the wall. Thank you. That's you're welcome. welcome.